if I had to ask you to give me a philosophical history of the mind-body problem, what story would you tell me? It has a long history back to uh, the classical era, but in the modern period, the basic mind-body problem that has entered and persisted in uh, modern philosophy is basically the Cartesian formula. Cartesian formula was based on uh, the fundamental principle of that initiated modern science, so-called mechanical philosophy. Philosophy, of course, meant science. Uh, so Galileo and his uh, contemporaries uh, sharply reacted against the neo-scholastic uh, reigning doctrines version of Aristotelianism, which uh, uh, ba were based on what they called occult properties. So two things, uh, two material bodies uh, attract each other because they have sympathies. An object moves be because of its internal energy, uh, its agency, it moves to the place where it belongs, its natural place. The natural place of a mater material object is the earth. Uh, and uh, so it falls. And other occult properties of this kind. They wanted actual explanations. And the explanations uh, had to be assumed, had to show that the world was intelligible. And there was a criterion for intelligibility. Namely, could it be, could what you describe be constructed by a skilled artisan? That's the mechanical philosophy. I have to remember that at this time, uh, Europe was... Uh, flooded with uh, complex, uh, intricate artifacts made by skilled artisans, which uh, modeled uh, humans, played puppet shows, uh, gardens in Versailles, you know, and all. it seemed all semi-human. In fact, it was kind of like today with a mostly misleading. The idea was a true explanation would be a mechanical model. That's the mechanical philosophy. Um, the uh, Descartes, uh, it was believed by essentially everyone. Uh, Galileo, Descartes, uh, Isaac Newton, Leibniz, uh, uh, Christian Huygens. It, it was simply the reigning doctrine of modern science. Uh, Descartes tried to work it out. He thought he had shown that there is a mechanical explanation for all phenomena of the world, with one exception, the human mind. He said the human mind has properties that cannot be accommodated by a mechanical object. Uh, one of them properties, incidentally, was language. He said the capacity of humans to uh, uh, create new expressions, indefinitely expressing new thoughts, and to do so in ways that are uh, appropriate to situations, but not caused by them is a property that goes beyond the capacity of mechanism. Uh, well, that was the, so he therefore is serious scientist. He established a new principle, res cogitans, in his metaphysics, a substance, thinking substance. And that's in addition to res extensa, matter. So there are two substances, matter and mind. And then of course he seek to link them and he argued that there's maybe a connection through the pineal gland, the, which is not duplicated in the brain, just one place. So that's basically the classical mind-body problem. Didn't last very long. Uh, Newton showed much to his distress that there are no bodies. One of the two uh, component, uh, elements of the picture disappeared, contrary to what's claimed by many modern philosophers, Gilbert Ryle and others. Uh, Newton didn't exercise the ghost in the machine. He exercised the machine. The ghost was left intact. He showed there are no bodies in the sense of the mechanical philosophy. Uh, Newton regarded this as a total absurdity. He said it's so absurd that no person with any scientific understanding can possibly believe it. And in fact, his main work is called, not called phys physics or in those days philosophy. It's called mathematics because as he said, he has only a mathematical account. He cannot give a physical explanation. There is, because what he's postulating makes no sense in physical terms. Uh, the, uh, 
for the rest of his life. In fact, he, uh, uh, he showed, in fact, that Descartes model didn't work. And in fact, no model would work. Uh, that's Newton's great discovery. He thought it was ridiculous. His contemporaries thought it was ridiculous. Uh, for the rest of his life, Newton tried to find uh, some kind of answer to this, but totally meant, I do not make hypotheses, was in the context of explaining that he has no physical explanation. So he can only give a mathematical model. Well, there were various reactions to this. One reaction, connection with the mind-body problem, was John Locke's. This is not in his major work, but in a letter to Stilling Fleet, he discussed this and his conclusion was basically, quote him, that uh, the uh, judicious Mr. Newton has demonstrated that God uh, 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 attributed to matter properties that we cannot conceive, that are inconceivable to us. And similar, he said, God may have super added to matter the property of thought, meaning some organized form of matter yields thought. That idea was picked up through the 18th century uh, by just about every, you know, major figures who tried to show how, uh, as some put it, the brain secretes thought the way the liver secretes bile. This reached its apogee with uh, uh, Priestley, the chemist philosopher, uh, in uh, the late 18th century developed these ideas extensively. Uh, in the 19th century, they were pursued, but not intensively, then they were forgotten. When the uh, uh, revolution took place in the 20th century, all of this was totally forgotten. In fact, it's still mostly unknown to philosophers and uh, cognitive scientists and others. It was rediscovered in the 20th century, the last decade. It was by mid 20th century, uh, essentially rediscovered in the study of language. That's what generative grammar is. But in the world of philosophy, cognitive science, it was not rediscovered until the last decade of the 20th century. It's called the decade of the brain, a decade devoted to uh, the brain. And at the conclusion of it, the uh, neuroscientist who uh, gave the concluding uh, summary of it, Vernon Mountcastle, uh, described what he called the thesis of the new biology, that uh, the thought is simply a property of the brain. This was considered a, what Francis Cripp called an astonishing hypothesis, radical new idea and philosophy of mind, very exciting. It's repeated in almost the same words, what was commonplace in the 18th century as a result of Locke's suggestion. And that's basically where it stands, I think. Uh, there was another consequence of Newton's demolition of the mechanical philosophy. Science changed its course. The early modern science, uh, Galileo through Newton, sought to discover an intelligible world that was given up. Uh, scientists kind of recognized tacitly, no, nobody actually said it, that you can't find an intelligible world. Uh, as John Locke said in um, his theological framework, uh, God has added to matter properties that are inconceivable to us, but it's just a fact. And in fact, science proceeded with that fact, not forgetting the theological framework. It just uh, sought intelligible theories. That's very different. So Newton's theories were intelligible. Leibniz, Huygens could understand Newton's theories. It was the world that they described that was unintelligible. And Newton agreed, uh, but the over time, science just lowered its aspirations to developing theories that were intelligible, however inconceivable of the world that they described, just abandoned that hope. By the time you get to 20th century, uh, Bertrand Russell knew the sciences very well. He um, simply said, it's ridiculous to seek intelligibility, who cares? We just want theories to work. That's a big difference from the early, uh, early modern science, which had much higher aspirations. Uh, this is often not understood. Uh, the uh, I should say there's more to it than that. Uh, Newton recognized 
that the world seemed to have inconceivable properties. And he speculated that as far as we know, all matter might be alive, all matter, including a, a coffee cup in front of, we know so little of matter that we can't show that it's not alive. In the 20th century, this was picked up independently. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, great astrophysicist, said, we know so little of matter that for all we know, all matter is conscious. Can't show that atoms aren't conscious because we just don't know anything about matter. Uh, Bertrand Russell had similar position. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's kind of interesting if you look at today's philosophy, philosophy what's exciting topic in philosophy today is what's called the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, the 17th century also had a hard problem. The hard problem was motion. Uh, how can you account for motion? Answer, you can't. Uh, but uh, the hard problem of the 17th century was quite different from today's hard problem. If you look at the hard problem of motion, the problem was formulated. You could state properties of motion. Say, here are the properties of motion. How can we find an explanation for them? That was the hard problem in the 17th century. And Newton's discovery was there's no explanation in what we consider physical. It's quite different. It's not formulated. Nobody, the problem is, what is it like to see the sunrise in the morning? Well, nobody can say what it's like to see the sunrise in the morning. You can write a poem about it maybe, but you can't say, here are the properties of it. Now, what is it like to be a bat? Nobody can say, what is it like to be me? I could write a book about it maybe, but I can't say, here are the properties. Well, there's this elementary thing, unless you state what you want an explanation for. So the hard problem of today's philosophy is formulated in a way which is unanswerable. So it's not a problem at all. It's just, uh, I'm confused, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not a problem. Uh, the, it's quite different from the 17th, 18th century when the problem was quite real and explicit and not answered. So I think we should be very cautious about paying attention to what's um, the hot topic in the philosophical literature. It's not a formulated problem. It's just an expression of confusion. And as far as the uh, radical new idea in philosophy, uh, that's Locke. Uh, and I think we should recognize the antecedents, the history, the context, and what is not conceivable to us, though apparently true. Mm. So, no, the there are so many different takes on consciousness at this point. So many people have different theories of consciousness. There's panpsychism, there's illusionism, there's idealism, reductive uh, physicalism, materialism. Where do you think we stand today? What do you think is the most prominent thought process behind theories of consciousness? Would you say it is reductive materialism? There is no such thing as materialism. Materialism if it exists, has to be, give some account of what matter is. Can't have a theory of materialism if you don't tell us what matter is. Mm. And nobody knows what matter is. See, there's no materialism. That's why, uh, as uh, Arthur Eddington, Russell, uh, actually Newton pointed out, uh, we have no concept of matter. So if you look at the problem of consciousness, what's so-called the problem of consciousness, we know a great deal about consciousness. In fact, we know more about consciousness than anything else. It's something that uh, both Russell and most more recently, uh, Galen Strawson have emphasized. I can tell you a ton of things about my current consciousness. I could describe in detail everything I'm seeing and so on. What we don't know is what matter is. Consciousness and matter, because we're ignorant of matter. That's why Eddington said, for all we know, uh, all matter is conscious because we know nothing about matter. As Newton said, uh, maybe all matter is alive because we don't know anything about matter. So these questions are not formulated in a coherent fashion. As far as panpsychism is concerned, uh, it's basically Eddington speculation. But actually, Galen Strawson is one who has argued for it in uh, interesting arguments. I'm personally not convinced, but uh, you know, coherent arguments at least. Uh, but until we are to, uh, what we can try to do is what was done by science after Newton 
showed that we cannot find an intelligible universe. Try to find intelligible theories. So let's construct the best theories we can to account for the properties of consciousness. That's all we can do. Can't reduce it to matter because we don't know what matter is. Can't say, I don't think you can say anything about panpsycho that we cannot show that all matter is not conscious, but that's because we don't understand anything about matter. In fact, if you think about it, what is matter? I mean, uh, there's a great physicist at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study, John Wheeler, who uh, suggested that maybe all there is in the universe is answers to the questions we pose. It's a theory called it from bit. All that exists is bits. We pose a question, get an answer, that's the universe. There's nothing else. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not competent to say whether this is a plausible theory or not, but suppose it is. Okay, then that's matter. Answers to our questions. Uh, right now, physicists are in the strange position of not being able to find, I think it's, it's the universe. Okay. That's where we are. You mm -hmm. can read articles in uh, quantum theory journals. Someone sent me one recently where a group of leading quantum theorists uh, debate what is a particle, the most fundamental question. I can't reach any conclusion. Well, that's where we are with regard to matter. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure now if you're familiar with Donald Hoffman's work and his theory of consciousness. Whose theory? Donald Hoffman. It's a description of properties of consciousness. Okay. Mm. I don't see a theory in the sense of explanation of anything. Mm. Because he's basically one of those physicists who have concluded that space and time in essence don't really exist. So what he's trying to do is build a theory where conscious agents are the fundamental entity of reality. And then he moves on from there. But, but where do you think the problem lies with starting from there? what is explained a theory is provides explanations that's what a theory is what is explained yeah it's a good question <laughs> what about that and uh, sorry did you want to add to that i just i just want to express my own ignorance with respect to the conclusions about space and time i'm not confident to comment i okay. know physicists are exercised about this and have no real answers i don't there seems to be a shift in physics at the moment where a lot of the theories are starting to expose that space and time the, the way we think about space time does not seem to be what even einsteinian physics uh, has shown us so newtonian physics both einstein and newton it all seems to be being thrown out the window at this point which is making some physicists question the fundamental nature of reality completely and and because of that it's opening up the doors to a new form of idealism where now consciousness is fundamental and then we move on from there what do you think about the, that approach of the idealistic view of seeing consciousness i don't think any of these discussions in physics which i'm not competent to have a judgment about i don't think any of them bear on consciousness in the least they don't tell us about the fact that you know, I see a red spot, what, what I feel like when I see the red spot, I don't see anything about that. That's consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, furthermore, I don't really understand the preoccupation with consciousness. It's pretty new. It's a pretty new preoccupation. It's not true in the history of philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the probably the major scholarly study of this is by Udo Thiel, who points out that consciousness became a issue in philosophy pretty much with uh, the Neo Neoplatonist 17th century Cartesians. Uh, uh, Ralph Cudworth, he says, was the first to discuss consciousness seriously. But they were talking about self-consciousness, mm -hmm. awareness of ourselves. And that be was the topic of consciousness right up to the 20th century. 20th century, for some reason, there was a sudden uh, great concern with consciousness. Uh, in recent years, it's been, as I said, the problem, the hard problem. Only trouble is it's not formulated, so it's not a problem. But why consciousness? I mean, it turns out if you, to the extent that we understand anything limited, 
take language, almost everything that's going on in our minds when you and I are conversing is completely beyond the reach of consciousness. There are mental processes taking place. We have a fair grasp about what many of them are, but we have no more awareness of them than we have of what's going on in our second nervous system. We have another huge nervous system called the enteric nervous system, sometimes called the gut brain. It's a huge nervous system, controls everything that's going on in the body. Uh, uh, mid billions of neurons uh, can have all the properties of Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, a uh, uh, huge nervous system. We know nothing, we know a lot about it, but from the outside, the way we study uh, the planetary motion, we have no introspection into it. And the same is true of this nervous system. We have almost no introspective evidence about it. Uh, very superficial phenomenon, but we can learn a lot about it the way you learn other things in science. Uh, but so why, and the mental acts that are taking place beyond the level of consciousness interact uh, indissolubly from the few fragments that we're conscious of. So you, you're not gonna find that happen to be conscious. You want a real theory of what's going on, you're gonna have to integrate whatever we know about or can discover about the internal uh, unconscious, not, not in a Freudian sense, inaccessible to consciousness. Uh, 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 operations that are going important are more important than the fragments that reach consciousness. I think it's more important. So it seems to me the emphasis is misplaced, plus the fact that the problem is not formulated. Till the problem is formulated, you're not going to have an answer to it. So I think philosophy is going off into a very dubious directions. I should say that Galen Strawson, one of the best young philosophers, is put this a little more strongly than I have, he, more strongly than I would. In fact, what he said is that 20th century philosophy is the silliest period in the history of philosophy. That's too strong, I think. But I do think there are real questions about it, including the uh, unwillingness to understand the history of the topic, which is revealing, I think. It's worth understanding how these problems developed uh, kind of thing we were talking about sheds a lot of light on what we should be doing, I think. But the mm -hmm. crucial issue is that the hard problem in the 20th century is not formulated as distinct from the hard problem in the 17th century, which was formulated and led to very interesting results. So until the today's hard problem is formulated, we'll just be wandering in the wilderness. Mm. Do you think we have focused so much energy into this hard problem of consciousness because just like because science has exposed so much about reality in terms of spirituality god um copernicus taking us out of the center of the universe you've got darwin taking us off the top of the food chain and now we have this last that allows us to at least maintain some sort of spirituality and maybe meaning value purpose do you think that's why we're so obsessed with this topic right now this frankly just seems to me empty talk. Uh, yes, we have consciousness. Uh, does my, I have a dog at my feet. Does she have consciousness? I assume so. Can't prove it or disprove it. Uh, does the microphone in front of me have consciousness? Well, as uh, Arthur Eddington pointed out, we know so little about matter that we can't say that it doesn't have consciousness because mm -hmm. we don't know anything about matter. So there's nothing to do with idealism, nothing to do with spirituality, nothing to do with our place in the universe. These are just uh, things that we're confused about. And my own view is a uh, much more interesting question is what's inaccessible to consciousness? Mm. I don't try to convince other people of what's interesting. I'm just saying to me, that looks much more interesting. We can learn a lot about it. We can discover how it is closely integrated with the tiny fragments that reach consciousness. Our brain is doing all kinds of things. Occasionally it's throwing off little bits and pieces that we're conscious of. Well, those fragments are of some interest, but I don't think they're of the main interest in finding out what our mental processes are. As far as the distinctiveness of human beings, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the kinds of questions you raised. First of all, we don't have to worry about it at all, but there are are distinctive properties of humans, totally distinct. 
And that's interesting. Uh, one distinctive property of humans is what you and I are now doing. There's no other organisms that can have discussions about mm. these or any other questions. That means language and thought, in any sense we understand thought, appear to be unique human characteristics. There's no analog to them anywhere in the world, maybe universe, and they seem to be common to all humans. So it looks like a species property. Uh, we don't know of any differences among humans in these capacities that can speak and grow up in any community and pick up easily the language and its thought system. So it seems to be just common human. It's pretty good reason to suspect that it that these capacities emerged along with modern humans. So if you look at the archeological record, it's skimpy, but there's something. There's no evidence for any meaningful symbolic activity before humans appear. You may get a scratch on a bone or something, but there's essentially nothing before humans appear. Not long after humans appear in evolutionary time, you start getting very rich and complex symbolic activity all of which suggests that uh, along with modern humans came these capacities, language, thought, which are probably the same thing uh, as was assumed incidentally by Aristotle, classical Indian philosophy and so on, didn't really distinguish language and thought that runs through pretty much until the modern period. But, uh, uh, and I think it's a plausible assumption. I think we're coming back to it, that language is just the system for generating thought. Thought is what's generated by language, internal thought, internal language, not, not the noises that we speak, which is superficial. Uh, if that's anywhere near true, then the interesting questions are what are the properties of this internal thought language system? I think that's much more interesting than the fragments that reach consciousness, which mm -hmm. are fr fragments, so we're probably not gonna learn much about them. I mean, a good example is uh, an illustration of this is what's called inner speech. Uh, when you think to yourself in language, if you pay attention to it, it's not language, it's the sounds. So when you think about a sentence, you can ask, how long is it? Uh, does it rhyme with another one? That's not language. That's the externalization of language in one or another sensory motor medium. And the sensory motor systems have nothing to do with language. They were there millions of years before language emerged. They've never changed. So they're non-linguistic systems that we use to externalize what's like. You could use gesture, sign, sign, just the same. Doesn't even have to do sound. Uh, so we don't want to be misled by that. What we call inner speech is not inner, it's outer. What's inner, we have no access to. Hmm. Do you think the fact that we English, for example, I mean, as someone who's obviously a master of linguistics and I mean, you're pretty much known as the father of cognitive science. Do you think that our limitations in terms of the language we use most often, which is English, well, for, for the most part in this case, limits our ability to discuss certain philosophical questions like this mind-body problem? Do you think if we had a different language that portrayed more meaning, perhaps ancient Chinese, Sanskrit, that we'd be better off today? There is a hypothesis, it's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Edward Sapir, Benjamin Lee Whorf, about a century ago, uh, arguing that the way we think is shaped in some significant way by the language that we speak. Uh, this hypothesis has been investigated empirically for about 75 years, almost nothing. I mean, a few superficial things. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, the first person to study it, Eric Lenneberg, who went on to found the biology of language, great scientist. Uh, he studied it, he was a friend of mine in graduate school. Uh, we, he studied this back in the early 50s uh, and he found a few things. So he found that uh, there are some languages that have, the languages differ in where they put the boundaries of the color words. Like some languages don't have color words, just black and white. Other languages like us have distinguished, say, red and orange. Uh, other languages don't distinguish red and orange. Uh, Hopi, for example. And you get some effects of that, but they're meaningless. So if you take a language which doesn't distinguish red and orange, and you ask people, you give them a patch of color, and then you 
show that patch of color again if it's on the red orange border if you speak english you'll remember that i called it red so you see it's red if you have a language read you don't have a label for that you won't remember so you won't call it you won't remember what it was i mean very superficial things like that have been discovered but nothing of any significance it's still widely debated but i think the pickings are very thin so it looks as if every language can has the way has ways of talking about everything of course may not have the words like a uh, hundred years ago you didn't have the word computer okay so you couldn't talk about them I mean, you could but not in our sense uh, uh, you didn't have uh, the word uh, you know uh, elementary uh, um, uh, uh, about quarks but that's any language can pick them up the same way mm -hmm. you mentioned these unconscious processes and it's and i mean the more intriguing question is how do those unconscious processes sort of come into these conscious ones. Um, what if you then think about people like Daniel Dennett, Keith Frankish, who sort of use the argument that because most of what we experience happens unconsciously, we merely via introspection tend to make a conclusion that we have some sort of ethereal entity. So in essence, there is no such thing as qualia. Rather, there is a memory of an experience that felt qualitative, but in essence, everything is in fact quantitative. What do you we think about that? that conclusion about the enteric nervous system the gut brain it's all unconscious do we assume there's some ethereal uh, spiritual thing going on in our gut not as far as i know so why should we do it for this brain why do we have to be uh, it's interesting that traditional dualism cartesian dualism metaphysical dualism was a real science serious scientific theory descartes had serious scientific arguments for postulating two substances, uh, metaphysical dualism was shown to be correct, incorrect, but lots of scientific theories are shown science. It's been replaced by something else, what I've sometimes called methodological dualism. Uh, methodological dual nobody will say I'm a methodological dualist, but a lot of people act that way, including the ones you're describing. They say, when we discuss something sort of below the neck, metaphorically speaking, we're allowed to be rational. When we discuss things up here, we have to become totally irrational. That's methodological dualism. As I say, nobody says, professes it, but you just said, why should we treat the unconscious processes here differently than the unconscious processes down here? I don't see any reason. I think Locke, John Locke was basically correct, uh, forgetting the uh, theological framework. Uh, However the world works, there are facts about motion that are inconceivable to us. And there are facts about thought that are inconceivable to us, but they're there and we can study them and learn about them and assume that whatever thought is, some, it's some property of organized forms of matter where matter is just whatever there is. When Locke used the word matter or body, he didn't mean anything specific. He said, whatever the world is constituted of, we don't know. Luton showed that we don't know. I think that's sensible attitude. And I don't think we've progressed beyond it. No, when you think about, I mean, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people are pretty much obsessed with this mind body problem because it's sort of a replacement for sort of agnosticism and atheism today. What advice do you give these people growing up today in a world where that science has proven so much and taken away so much in terms of their spirituality and their um, purpose in life. Um, what what can you tell them in order to to keep going, keep keep moving forward, and keep focusing? <laughs> Just as some sort of a inspirational um, advice from your side. <laughs> I can't speak for others, but uh, I find inspiration enough in uh, what uh, Galileo, for example, regarded as one of the most awesome. Uh, features of the universe. For Galileo and his contemporaries, one of the most amazing things in the universe, awe-inspiring, was what you and I are now doing. How can humans be capable of, construct from a finite number of symbols, constructing an infinite number of thoughts, and even using these thoughts to convey to others who have no access to our minds, the innermost workings of our minds. So you have no access to my mind, 
but I can convey to you with a finite number of symbols, the innermost workings of my mind. Galileo thought this is the most amazing uh, phenomenon in the universe. Uh, Galileo himself regarded the alphabet as the most spectacular of human inventions because it was able to implement this uh, comparable to Michelangelo or Titian. Well, to me, that seems inspiring enough. I've sometimes called it the Galilean challenge. How is this conceivable? It's Court Descartes' problem, which led him to postulate a second substance. Well, as we Newton showed, we're left with only one substance, mind. The other one disappeared, body. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't see why we need, uh, I, mean, I find it inspiring enough that uh, physicists uh, cannot discover 95%, I think that's the number, of what constitutes the universe. Seems mm -hmm. to me exciting enough. When the more we discover, the more we realize how much we don't know. Um, for example, I mean, the Libet's experiments, a lot of the experiments on free will, a lot of people believe now that we have no free will. What are your thoughts on the relationship between mind and free will? That's an interesting question. Uh, every one of us acts, acts as though we believe in freedom of will, 100% of us, including those who deny that there is free will. They all act as if if they believe in free will, point number one. Point number two, does science tell us anything about it? Answer, no. Science tells us can't determinism, 